Okay, so welcome to our panel on adolescent SRH. I'm just gonna take the prerogative of throwing another R on there. Um, you are the intrepid few who have stuck it out through all day or maybe all two days, and for that we're very thankful and appreciative. I think you will find that we will have a very stimulating conversation here we have incredible panelists who I won't spend too much time introducing because their full bios are in your packets and we have limited time and we want to also hear from you. Um, but just to say that I'm Larry Thompson with the International Center for Research on Women and it is my real pleasure to be um, moderating this panel. So I'm going to tee up the panel with a couple of introductory remarks. We will move into full presentations by each of the speakers. Um, and then I, if there's time, I might ask them a couple follow-up questions. If there's not, we're gonna allow a 20-minute period for questions with you all. So please make sure you have those questions. I don't think we're doing cards. I think you have to actually properly raise your hand and ask questions and introduce yourself. So away we go. Um, you know, it's, it's, very, it's very timely that we're having this discussion today because the, uh, the Lancet, which is this incredible um, medical journal, just published last week a issue on a, from a commission that they organized on adolescent health and well-being. Um, and I think that's a fairly telling um, affirmation of all of the work that you do and that we do um, on this issue, which is to say, George Patton, who is the academic who is the lead author on this commission report, said last week at the launch, adolescents are probably the most overlooked demographic in global health. And then they attempt to tease out various three kind of broad categories of where health risks facing adolescents around the world are today. And they look specifically at sexual and reproductive health, of course, as they should. Um, and that, I think, there's some interesting findings in here, one of which is, according to this, there is, this is one of our limited areas of good news stories, that adolescent birth rates are falling, that um, we are seeing less unplanned pregnancy, we are seeing things move in the right direction, and there's actually a really wonderful affirmation of this community's efforts to make that happen over the years, to draw attention to these issues, to you know, raise money, to lobby for dollars and investment by governments. But I think there's also, and there's certainly some pockets where there are gaps in our knowledge, but generally speaking, the Lancet says we know the most about this issue. And these three experts are going to kind of fill in the blanks on that. They're gonna either push back on this idea that this is where the victory is and tell us why that's not the case, or they're going to tell us what we still don't know, what wasn't in the numbers that are in, in the Lancet um, piece. So um, I also want to just get us thinking about the frameworks through which we can advance change on these issues. The Lancet points to the global strategy on uh, maternal child and now adolescent health, the recent addition of adolescents as a key demographic there. Um, as I call it, the everybody but men strategy. Um, but there's also the SDGs, there's the new girl strategy that we just fangirled over in the last lunch panel. So let's be thinking about what are the tools that we have, both from the program side and the policy side, to answer some of these, these questions and make sure that these, these wins are sustained. So with little further ado, um, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Catherine McCarthy who is at the Population Council and is going to help us zoom in from the global level of adolescent health broadly. She's gonna look at some of the numbers specifically for very young adolescents um, globally. So over to you. Thank you, Lyric. Hi, everyone. I'm very excited to be here with all of you today talking about very young adolescents. So much of the work I'm going to speak about today um, on the sexual and reproductive health and loss of rights among very young adolescents or adolescents between the ages of 10 and 14 is drawn from a recent Population Council report, which is co-authored by myself and council colleagues Martha Brady and Kelly Hallman. And this report really is a 
draws attention to the unique needs and risks among this very young adolescent age group, as well as the opportunities for intervention and prevention efforts. You can find more about the report if you um, look at that URL listed on the bottom of the slide. So why focus on very young adolescents? Generally, the ages of 10 to 14 is a time of relatively good health relative to other life phases. And as a result, adolescents, particularly these younger ages, have tended to be overlooked in the global public health and development agenda. You may be familiar with this slide here by Susan Sawyer, which depicts adolescents in the life course. And what we see here is that although young people start out healthy, while they transition to adulthood, this picture rapidly changes. Behaviors and practices established in this period affect health and outcomes in later adolescence and throughout life. So the time to prevent the dramatic rise in disease burden, including outcomes related to sexual and reproductive health, is in this period before behavioral patterns are set and while life circumstances and gender norms are in more flux. Given the numerous um, biological, social, and development changes that occur during adolescence, many researchers tend to view this period as a series of stages rather than one homogeneous stage. In general, girls experience pubertal onset earlier than boys do. For both boys and girls, this is a defining moment where physical changes signal outward social role changes for which young people may or may not be developmentally prepared for. In some settings, this leads to pivotal life events, such as school dropout, child marriage, sexual coercion, and early childbearing, which can have lasting consequences throughout life, especially when they're experienced early. Evidence of such transition is seen in these two graphs shown on the slide. On the left-hand side of the panel, we see nationally representative datum for four countries, which are used as case studies to illustrate a common pattern of dropout that occurs among adolescent girls and accelerates between the ages of 13 and 14, which is a time that coincides with transition to secondary school as well as pubertal onset. And in the right-hand side, we can see nationally representative data among indigenous girls in Guatemala. And we can see here how going off track in one area of life, which is school dropout, can coincide with other negative life events, here early marriage and early childbearing. So what do we know about the sexual and reproductive health outcomes among very young adolescents? Well, generally among 10 to 14 year olds, the primary health concerns are not related to sexual and reproductive health. The top concerns are actually related to nutrition and mental health. However, as young people transition to the ages of 15 and 19, maternal mortality becomes the second largest cause of mortality among girls, and this is globally. And it's also the third largest cause of morbidity. While data among younger age adolescents in 10 to 14 are more patchy, what we do know is that younger girls experience earlier sexual onset um, at higher rates than boys do, although the data are limited and what we, what we do know um, is more about these older age groups. We also know that earlier sexual experiences are more likely to be coerced. And we also know that puberty is a time that also coincides with many cultural rights of practices, which may be synonymous with the loss of rights, such as child marriage and female genital mutilation and cutting. So how can we identify and assess young adolescents at risk of such outcomes? You may be familiar with this figure of the ecological model by Paul Bloom. And what we know is that there are several multi lap or overlapping and multi-level influences that shape young adolescent lives. In our Investing When It Counts report, we examined several of these that are related to the immediate environment of adolescence. The ages of 10 to 14 are typically a time when young people are enrolled in school or residing with one or both parents. And thus, they spend a great deal of time in both of these environments. And these two domains are potentially great sources of knowledge, skills, and protection. Young people who do, are not residing with either parent and who are not residing in school um, may lack ad access to these resources and may be in positions of vulnerability. 
However, there are several other influences which may operate inside or outside of these domains, which can undermine their utility, and they can also turn these into harmful environments. And these include factors such as exposure to violence and inequitable gender norms. There are also specialized circumstances, including migration, trafficking, and crises contexts, which may uproot young people from these traditional support systems. But we can use existing data to examine the prevalence of these influences in young adolescent lives. The data here are from the demographic uh, health surveys. And in our Investing When Accounts report, we examined nationally rep representative data from 71 low middle income countries. A snapshot of that uh, larger table is shown here. And factors that we looked at included the percentage of 10 to 14 year olds who resided with neither parent nor were enrolled in school and the percentage of 10 to 14 year olds who are not sitting at their grade for age. And this is defined as two or more years lag in intended grade for age. Both of these are disaggregated by gender. I'd just like to point out that the DHS collects data on 10 to 14 year olds at the household level. So they're interviewing a household member about the status of the adolescent or by asking adolescents older than age 15 to retrospectively recall their experiences. We use these and other data sources to learn as much as we can about the environment where young adolescents reside. This analysis is essential for identifying off-track adolescents, as well as situations that are likely to increase their exposure to harmful influences, which can guide prevention programming. When warranted, however, sensitive information, including exposure to sexual violence, can also be reported from young adolescents themselves. This here um, is data from a study led by the Population Council and International Rescue Committee among adolescent girls in a rural county of Liberia. The survey used validated measures from the Violence Against Children survey, which are another source of information about violence exposures that are reported from youth themselves. When collecting such information, it's absolutely necessary to have appropriate training of the research team. However, it is possible to get ethical approval for such research when there is sufficient cause um, about the magnitude of the problem and the potential to test in a potentially efficacious intervention, which was the case here. So what do we know about what works to prevent or delay the negative sexual and reproductive health outcomes and loss of rights that can occur in early adolescence? Well, there's no one recipe for success, but what we do know is that comprehensive approaches are most likely to be successful. We know that factors such as economic vulnerability, inequitable gender norms, and lack of social support contribute to poor outcomes among young adolescents. And so developing interventions that equip the adolescents with the assets to avoid these risks are most likely to show success. Examples include comprehensive sexuality education, particularly programs that promote gender equity at young ages. Also programs including financial education, livelihood trading, and savings can equip adolescents with the economic resources to avoid positions of vulnerability that can lead to sexual coercion. Programs that target uh, educational transitions, particularly the transition to secondary school, such as conditional cash transfer programs, have shown a great deal of success in reducing the probability of child marriage and also early childbearing. And finally, parents are a great underutilized resources who can be engaged by programs to strengthen skills such as communication and to reduce abusive parenting behaviors and improve the quality of relationships. While well, all of this evidence shows promise, however, really there is a great lack of information on this specific 10 to 14 year old age period and most programs are not designed with 10 to 14 year olds in mind. This is really critical because we're learning so much about the brain and cognitive development in adolescents and we can take advantage of this pre prevention programming to make sure we're developing the most effective programs. Additionally, there's a great dearth of research among young adolescents in low and middle income countries, which is very challenging as this is where 90% of the world's adolescents reside, and they're often um, context of increased um, challenges and other things that need to be addressed. So our Investing When Accounts report goes through a number of recommendations to strengthen research and programming. Um, I'm just going to mention a few of them here. 
I really want to stress the importance of collecting data not only among adolescent girls but also adolescent boys. We need to understand how adolescent lives diverge in this period so that we can develop interventions and tailor them appropriate by both gender and by sex. And we advocate for disaggregating data into finer age groups such as two and three year intervals given the numerous changes that are ongoing during this time. And in this way we can really build the evidence base of what works and for what segments of the adolescent population to embed into our programming. There is a number of tools and resources for gathering information among young adolescents in the report, and I encourage you to take a look. And thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. You've actually teed up very perfectly our next speaker, um, who's going to tell us a little bit about boys. Um, this is Pamela Saavedra Castro. She's with the Universidad de Chile, as well as Cultura Salud. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here. I'm really glad to be here after a long trip, but well, <laughs> um, uh, as she said, as Lyric said, I'm going to talk about young men and SRH. It's an overview of Latin America and specifically of Chile, where I came from. So, some data. Uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean, around 20 to 20, uh, 10 to 20 percent of women uh, between the ages of 15 and 19 already have at least one child or are currently pregnant. This is something that uh, Kathy says, um, and uh, the pregnancy rate is 30 to 50 percent higher if there is no formal education or if the, the girls drop out of school. So, uh, in a comparative research about gender masculinities and gender policies that we, we did now, uh, that Cultura Salud did um, between Brazil, Chile, and Mexico, we found that young men are more likely to use contraceptive methods or condom. This is a, a tricky um, data because even though they are more likely to use it, it's because um, adult men uh, all, um, usually are in a long-term relation, so they kind of not use it. On the other hand, we have uh, that young men are more likely to ask to be in the delivery room. The thing is that they ask to be in the delivery room, but they are not allowed to be there. Uh, the health healthcare, uh, the health centers uh, put them out, so they prefer to be to to the, the mother of the girl to be with with the, the pregnant uh, girl. Uh, Besides, fatherhood is seen as, a, as the final task of, of manhood in this group, and the, the young child. In Latin America, um, sexuality and, and, man, uh, and fatherhood is a big part of uh, being an adult and being a man. So having a kid uh, at young age is, being a, is, is seen as like um, a big reward for them. Uh, some data about Chile, that is so recent, this is uh, just launched. Uh, as, as you can see, uh, pregnancy teenage, teenage pregnancy, sorry, uh, is decreasing uh, among these years between 2013 and 2015. But if you see in the, the chart over there, um, young adolescent pregnancy is increasing. That is a very worrying data because if you if you can see the, the green chart <laughs> the green is decreasing but the 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 11 12 and 13 years in 2015 are increasing uh, and we we know that some of them most of them are because of by uh, rapes of family Ma uh, family men, uh, fathers or uncles, and that's really worrying. So, why is this like this? 
in Chile, uh, we have almost none uh, sex sexual education in school. This is not a, a thing that is in the curriculum. Uh, we are a secular state, but we have a really, really Catholic socialization. So um, we, as in many countries, but we treat women that have a active sexuality as sluts and men as studs. So that um, that puts a barrier uh, with with me, with women and and makes that. Uh, a marker of masculinity status, um, and also, sorry, and also um, the Catholic socialization scenes as kids don't have sex. I mean, they see as our little girls, our little boys, they couldn't have sex, so because they are kids. So it's really weird because they, they blind themselves and do not uh, educate boys and girls to have protective and, and safe sex. Uh, also, we are educated to be abstin uh, to the abstinent matter, not the contraceptive or, or um, safe sex. Uh, so this go, uh, goes with a risky sexual behavior. Last data says that we have a 0 0.028, it's really low uh, HIV, rate in young population, but this is an increase of 74.1% compared to the previous, previous period. This is from 2004, 2008, and now the, the, this data is from 2008 to 2012, 2012 sorry. Um, we kind of, uh, ha men, boys, have this risky sexual behavior because, as I said, this is a marker of masculine status. So we, uh, they, they have a thing that they call la prueba de amor, que is like the proof of love, and, and it's when the, the boy asks his girlfriend or the, the, the girl he's, date, he's dating to have unprotected sex with him. Uh, in, in matter to to prove that that girl is re really loves him, really loves him, or, and is really faithful to him. So this is a, a really, really risky sexual behavior, and it's really common in adolescents. Um, so that's one hand of this problem. The other problem is the barriers in health centers. As I said, uh, young boys have really uh, strong entry barriers. Uh, to the health centers, they don't feel safe, they, don't, they feel ashamed, or they think they already know everything that they have to know about sex. Uh, well, I, at least they say so. <laughs> uh, another thing is that we uh, don't have abortion, uh, legal abortion. In my country, abortion is a crime, and you can go ye uh, to Yale for that. Um, so, uh, little girls that are raped cannot have uh, an abortion, so they have to have the child, even though it's for a rape. Uh, so what, what we think that works in these cases, uh, friendly spaces, we call uh, the, when in health centers, you, uh, you have the, the, um, the, the young boys and girls to have a, um, a flexible schedule for the young, for, for them, because they are in school or they have uh, works. And most important, uh, the confidentiality. So they, because they are ashamed to go to the health centers because they're gonna find, uh, they're gonna meet there with their uncles and with their neighbors, so they don't want to be there. They don't want to know that they're asking for help or they're asking for um, in contraceptive methods because of uh, they are really ashamed that they, they, everyone knows that they are having sex, especially girls. So this works because it, it encourages to have safety relations and, and feel safe about their own sexuality. 
Uh, that's the most important thing that Friendly Spaces ha has, has done. Some graphics. This is an um, impact assessment that we did about Program 8 adaptation. Uh, program 8 is a Promundus program. Uh, and uh, they have activities with young, uh, with young men to encourage a critical reflection about manhood. So, as we can see in the greener uh, chart, is the, um, is the first uh, survey, and then the, the second one is, the, is after the, the program. So, uh, in the control group, we can see that the frequency of use of condom uh, is, uh, is increased, and in the, the group that is that has been in the, the program, uh, it lowers, it, it is low. Also, um, and this is a very important thing about this program, uh, uh, this program encourages boys to, to have a, a, joint, uh, a joint decision maker about uh, the use of condoms. So they ask more to their partners to use the condom. And well, ah, also, uh, this program um, shows that boys are more, uh, have more gender equitable attitudes. Uh, uh, well, it's an statistic, uh, well, it's, <laughs> it's more than the, the, ex, the, the control group. So what are we doing now? We are now working in an SRH campaign orientated to male population, general male population, about sexual, sexual harassment in the streets, the use of condom, the LHBT rights, fatherhood, and the barriers to SRH services. Uh, we are working to, to the, the people in the health centers to, uh, to encourage them to uh, engage pe uh, boys to, to participate in these health centers. These are some drafts of the, the graphic campaign that we have in. Uh, the, the, and so, as Ambassador Russell said, just, just said, we have to engage boys and men in gender issues. So, yeah, it's true that they are, they are perpet perpetrators of sexual violence, but we have to work with them to prevent these things. And I think, and we think as Cultura Salud, that this is a really important matter for, for gender equality. So yeah, that's, that's all. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Pamela. All sorts of things we want to know more about. Um, and we'll have time to explore. Our, uh, Next presentation here today is going to drill down even further and look specifically at transgender issues um, in Kenya. So it is my pleasure to introduce Lexi Ogeta, who is a human rights activist and specifically a transgender rights activist in working with Jin Siangu, a local organization in Nairobi. Over to you. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for having me today. Um, I would like to acknowledge the, uh, the panelists um, for such a wonderful presentation. And before I even start, I'd like to say that I'm very nervous. <laughs> and oh my God, and I don't know how to use this thing, so I'll probably just use my laptop. And yes, oh, you press there, oh, okay. Do you want me to click for you? Please do, that would be very nice. So yes, so why include uh, transgender people and populations in this conversation of boys and girls? Um, yes, so can I get to the next slide? Yep. Um, that's, that's not it, okay, let's, yes. So why explicitly discuss this uh, rights amongst the community in, of the transgender, of the transgender community? Uh, HIV prevalence amongst the, uh, the transgender community is 49 times uh, that of the general population. Very little is known about trans men. 
and it kind of just builds a basis of why discuss SRH services and HIV needs amongst the populations generally. So uh, we had a study in Kenya, this was in 2015, almost 15 months ago. And basically what we found out was that HIV prevalence is very high. And the reasons why this prevalence is so high in Kenya is that there's lack of acceptance from family, uh, issues of lack of identification, and uh, which leads to limited education, which leads to limited uh, job opportunities, which li leads to limited um, risky behaviors, aka sex work, which also leads to high prevalence in the, uh, in the community. Um, another thing is transgender people are not prioritized in HIV response in the, and the Kenyan government. This is because we are not explicitly mentioned uh, in transgender programming in key populations, especially in government frameworks out there. So that also in, kind of serves as a basis as to why the prevalence is so high. Um, another thing is affirmation of identity for young transgender women and may lead to risky behaviors. I want to be accepted as a woman and for that reason, whatever happens, whatever risky behavior I engage to is kind of an acceptable way of me to be affirmed as a woman. So I will engage in risky behaviors because I want to be affirmed as one. And another thing is uh, coercion to engage in unprotected sex or risk of blackmail or physical violence. So these are some of the things we have to uh, deal with as a young population and as a young, um, transgender movement in Kenya in terms of uptake and why the prevalence is so high in Kenya. Um, Gender-based violence is also another thing that we have to deal with. And this is kind of um, trying to um, inform the whole ideology of why the risk is so high and, w and what violence does to uh, the transgender community in terms of the prevalence. Uh, violence amongst uh, transgender people is widespread and it's a constant concern. And police harassment is widespread and a, cons and, and, and a constant concern for many transgender people. Um, the most important uh, people to work with in decrease of violence against transgender people is the police, because they're the main perpetrators of violence uh, to the community. Uh, transgender sex workers have an increased and high levels of violence in the community, I mean, co compared to other uh, trans people who are not exactly sex workers. So there's that uh, particular uh, effect and that a special need, not need, but a very pe peculiar uh, condition that makes trans sex workers uh, at a higher prevalence uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the menace. So why is uptake so low within the community? I mean, the, the double stigma if, of living with HIV leads to testing and avoidance. We, we, we look at prioritizing of uh, your transition over the SRH and HIV services. Trans people will rather um, uh, focus on their trans transitioning other than uptake of SRH services. So that also kind of feeds into the prevalence of the, the HIV menace in the community. Um, another issue is healthcare providers do not particularly understand the specific needs of uh, transgender people and which kind of makes trans people not want to uh, get those services from uh, the particular provider. Um, another thing is the, the issue of lumping of MSM issues and trans, uh, trans issues together in terms of programming. That's another reason as to why the prevalence is so high is because um, trans women particularly feel like they do not uh, belong in the same space as MSM programming, and so they will not go to an MSM-specific clinic to get uh, a particular service because they feel like they do not identify with that 
um, particular environment. Stigma and discrimination is also another thing that is very uh, predominant um, in the in the in, in addressing as to why uptake is so low, and a lot of people do not want to be outed or, or to be mentioned as explicitly as transgender people in the community. So. For that reason, they particularly do not want to address uh, or go to specific um, clinics and places of, of, of service. Um, I'll kind of just uh, rush through uh, the main reason of the study, and we kind of just look at uh, the contextual reason as to why APTEC is so low. And we kind of look at issues of uh, gender-related uh, harmful norms that are out there. I mean, we want to speak contextually in terms of the environment we're in. We are in Kenya and we deal with a lot of uh, harmful and gender-related beliefs out there and how these beliefs and norms affect um, uptake of services. So I'll kind of just kind of go through some of uh, very, f one of the many um, reasons, many um, beliefs out there about trans people. And in, the, in our culture, we, we have people saying that transgender people are cast or they're possessed. Transgender is a Western invention and it's not African. So just to name a few of the kind of reasons as to why uptake is so, um, Law is that, and as to why trans people, transgender people will not particularly access or will not want to access services to a particular community because they feel like they are cursed and they are not, and it's a Western invention, and they are confused and they're mentally ill, and they basically want to bring violence unto themselves. So, as a as a as a, as a guiding point to moving forward is we came up with successful programs for transgender people and we kind of had an, an idea of saying that whenever we want a successful program to work for the transgender community is this program should be developed and be in consultation with transgender people for an impactful um, result. It should be for a specific context. Uh, we all know that transgender issues are very diverse. They're not the same all over the world. Whatever works in Europe is not what happens, works in America. Whatever happens in, um, in Kenya is not what happens in South Africa, for example. And kind of like we come up with a few recommendations and in the sense of integrating uh, the mainstream um, organizations and mainstream organizing for in SRH issues and HIV programming. And, we, and especially for the young people. Uh, we kind of, kind of came up with a few recommendations that would mean incorporating um, gender identity and sexual education for youth within your programming. So it would be very important that you don't necessarily just focus on young boys or young girls, but also include young boys who are trans people and young girls who are also trans. So as a way to kind of combat this whole menace is incorporating all these issues together. Another uh, more tailored programming would be um, building a transgender people's knowledge of their sexual and reproductive rights and how they can advocate for these issues themselves. We all know that we are, what's the saying? Um, the feminist saying, uh, nothing for us without us. It's, it's very important to include the community when it comes to advocating for our rights. And, and it starts right now, and it, it, it's, it's all about engaging with the mainstream organization, in, engaging with mainstream people who do, and CSOs who work with um, young girls, young boys, adolescent, adolescent girls, and integrating their programmatic work in terms of reach to young transgender people and having a greater impact in terms of addressing these uh, challenges um, and, and kind of just worldwide, basically. So thank you so much for your time. And I was really nervous. I hope it didn't sound like I was. <laughs> thank you. Great job. Great job. 
Um, okay, we have, I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative to ask each panelist one follow-up question, and then um, please be thinking about what you would like to ask, what you would like to know more about, and then feel free to raise hands and questions. Um, I'm not sure if we have mics or not, but just project, speak from the belly. Um, so going back to you, Catherine, you know, actually all of the themes of all of the presentations um, revolved around the importance of education in terms of knowing about bodies, rights, and services. Um, you included in your presentation a brief mention of comprehensive sexuality education. I was wondering if you could unpack that for us because I think we use this term a lot, but it means different things to different people. Um, so give us a sense of what that's all about and how it's most effective. I'd be happy to. Can you all hear me? OK. <laughs> Thank you for the question. So comprehensive sexuality education gives concrete skills and resources for young people on how to avoid unintended pregnancy, how to protect themselves against STIs and sexually other sexually transmitted infections and HIV, and resources where they can go to get those. Um, services that they require. Um, one thing that we have recently learned that a colleague of mine at the Population Council, Nicole Haberlin, um, recently published in the International Perspectives on Sexual and Reproductive Health, um, she conducted a systematic review of comprehensive sexuality programs, and this was including um, data from high income and low middle income countries. And one of her main foundings was that um, in comparing programs that included gender norm programming. She found that comprehensive sexuality programs that included um, gender norm programming and had specific, um, you know, promoted concrete thinking about challenging these roles um, were five times more likely to be successful in reducing STIs and unintended pregnancies than programs that did not include any programming around gender norms. So that is a really powerful finding. And I think that in terms of improving outcomes for both girls and boys, we should take advantage of this early adolescent period where gender norms are not firmly entrenched. You know, the earlier the better. And we can really promote change at this level. And in, so we should really be promoting this in our comprehensive sexuality programs. Amen. Um, you know, that's interesting. That's something that the Lancet gets into a bit as well, is, is um, you know, that this, the plasticity of the brain at this mm -hmm. point, the, the susceptibility to peer-to-peer -to -peer, um, knowledge transmission and all of these sorts of things is um, really means that we do have to look early and often at these issues. Um, Lexi, I actually would like to pick up with you on that question and say the exact same question back to you. What does comprehensive sexuality education mean to you in the context that you're looking to see improvement in outcomes you care about? Uh, does this work? Oh, mm -hmm. it does. Um, c comprehensive sexuality, the question asked, definitely means integration, which is very important um, in, 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 in terms of coming with impactful and more result-oriented uh, decisions and programming and all that. And for the long time, and I, I want to speak specifically for the trans community yes, and please. young trans community. For a long time, a lot of programming work is directed towards a specific population. Trans people have been left out in programming and we see the prevalence keeps going up and up and up and up and it keeps getting higher and higher and higher. So my thing is integration and kind of acknowledging in your programmatic work the importance of including these populations in your work and what impact it has is very important. So inclusion for me is one of the major things we need to uh, include in our work. We need to involve trans communities in our regions, find out what the needs are. How can you help? Because you, you can always, it's, it's structural. It's, it's what are the needs of the population, the trans population in my context. What do I need to um, 
to do to address these challenges? What are the trends CBOs and organizing telling me about what I need to do in terms of programming and how am I incorporating that into my work? So that's very important to me, and that's how it starts. It starts with inclusion, mm -hmm. yes. Nothing about us without us. Um, Pamela, you very quickly introduced us to a, a program that looked like it had just flipped your bar chart exactly opposite in terms of being able to get young boys, young male adolescents to go from not using condom and contraception to just just, I mean, your rates just completely swapped, but you didn't tell us what was in that package. What, what was the intervention? How did you see that sort of result? And how can we all, you know, take that up in our own work? Um, yeah, well, thank you. Uh, program 8 is a, uh, is a program, yeah, uh, based on a bunch of activities, like a bunch of workshops with boys, uh, young men between the ages of 14 and I think 17. Well, it it depends on the country because every country can adapt this. Um, it started in, in Brazil, in Promundo, and it has been applied in um, educational population and in sports, uh, different kinds of groups that uh, boys are always going to, so it's, it's more like that. We, oh, I mean Cultura Salud, uh, apply the, uh, them, uh, work with uh, general boys, it did not uh, found a specific target like uh, sports or, or so, so uh, work with boys in these workshops, they are kind of Mm, I think it, there is like 30 or 40 sessions um, and uh, they work on sexuality, SRH, uh, HIV, um, teenage pregnancy, gender attitudes, gender equality attitudes, um, violence, that is a really important part of the program H to prevent violence. Uh, and yeah, so these boys that um, go to program eight, uh, almost in every country that has been applied, um, increase their their gender equality attitudes. So, um, and as I said, um, we have an impact assessment. That is something that in Latin America is very unlike. Uh, no, how you say it? Uh, that doesn't happen a lot. We don't have many impact assessments. So, uh, Program 8 has been one of the, the programs that has been uh, uh, investigated and, and is, uh, ha, had, have had the impact that we are hoping that they had. So, yeah, it's more like a, a, a bunch of sets uh, of, of activities to, to, to young men to apply. And then we try to do that to a bunch of health centers so they can apply them and they can adapt the program to their own context. So that's another thing we have to do now. Perfect. You've given us our marching orders. <laughs> um, we'd love to hear from you. If you have questions, can you please um, raise your hand and then stand up um, and speak loudly as possible. Introduce yourself and please do come to a question at the end of your introduction and statement. Yes, please.
Thank you for those two excellent questions, and I'll invite the panel to respond. I've been asked to go question by question, um, so we're not going to collect a group, but no, get your hand ready. Any panelists want to start? Yeah, um, yeah, we don't have abortion, legal abortion. Um, now, uh, it's in Congress um, the, the opportunity to have abortion in three, three specific situations, that is uh, for rape, uh, for the, uh, how do you say it? Threat of life to the mother. Yeah, uh, yeah. And <laughs> that, incest? Uh, no, 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 not incest. No, no. It's the the life of the the mother, the life of the the unborn, and for rape. Ah. We and incest is not a thing in Chile. Um, it just happens, but nobody sees. <laughs> so yeah, we have that in Congress, and we also have in Congress a law for. Uh, sexual harassment arras in the streets. So that's our two points that we're trying to get and we are really trying to, to, to be approved, to try to get them approved, but it's really, really hard because we are a very, very conservative um, country and pol politicians don't think that women to have um, the the right to own their own bodies, so that's really really hard to for us to to make them see that it's important. Yeah. I would be happy to expand a little bit on what Pamela started there. Um, so, in terms of your first question, changing legal frameworks. Um, well, I can't speak to transgender and HIV policies. The population has done a lot of work in the area of child marriage, which is entrenched in many countries and also um, a legal framework that's often very difficult to change. And some of the work that we have found to be successful is really engaging change agents and community leaders in the conversation while at the same time empowering the girls themselves um, also working at the community level. So it's really working at these multiple levels um, to, to start building the awareness and the need and then take it to the broader national level where you can um, have the voice and the power to change the legal frameworks as well. Um, in terms of your second question, it's a great question. I think in terms of the need to really disaggregate data and look more finely at what works for different segments of adolescent populations, one way to achieve this is really by adopting indicators that map onto this. Because I think that what we measure is what we do. And so if we want to measure outcomes at these finer age categories and these very young adolescent age groups, it's a really critical time where you can sustain the gains from early childhood and prevent you know, life courses from going off track into adulthood, then we really should have um, in our global agendas, we should be tracking these things at these finer groupings. And this can better inform programming about what we know works and really build the evidence base, which can then lead to better programming. Lexi, would you like to come in on either of those? Of course. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> all I had was Kenya, Kenya, Kenya. <laughs> so I was literally being put on the spot. Um, so uh, change of legal framework, um, and uh, I'm, I'm very much uh, a transgender um, focused advocate person. So, um, and, I, and I still want to go back to the whole issue of the legal framework and sex work and transgender communities and all these things. In Kenya, um, being transgender is not criminalized. It's not explicitly mentioned. It's very vague. Actually, it's not vague, it's not mentioned. So the, the issues we have to go through in Kenya is, like most transgender people all over the world, is change of name, recognition, basically legal recognition. And, but the fact that you're not recognized in a system makes it very easy for you to manipulate the system. 
to your advantage. So um, a change of name is a change of name, whether you are changing your name because of marriage, <laughs> whether you're changing your name because of uh, identity, whether you're changing your name, a change of name is a change of name. So th that is kind of the advocacy we try to use when you're doing it. When I speak about sex, then I have to speak about impersonation laws, which are also there. Now, the impersonation laws come in when they feel like you're being this way in order to commit a particular crime. You are dressing in this manner, in this transitioned manner for you to commit a crime. So that's where the impersonation laws come in. And of course, we, we want to challenge that. And you want to, we want what and all our uh, advocacy initiatives kind of want to address that. What does this impersonation mean? What does it look like? When it comes to sex work, there's no particular law that can directly tie you to that. It's always a very funny thing they use to arrest you. It's always loitering with intent to. It's always, and then the evidence they use is, uh, oh my gosh, you had a condom in your bag. Oh, perfect. This is, this is evidence. Why did you have a condom with you in that street that late at night? So it's, it's never very direct. It's just administrative action. It's someone feeling like, I don't like you. I don't feel like you're doing the right thing. I don't like you as a woman being in the streets at midnight. So I, I will impose this on you. And it all just goes back to gender norms. What you feel is right for a particular sex and, and you feel like you have the right to punish someone for being expressive and, and how they want to carry them, to, to conduct themselves at, at a particular time in their lives. So the, the thing, it, it's, it's never about the law specifically, at least for us in Kenya. It's always about what I, as a police officer, feel is right for you. And that is directly indicated by the norms out there. What, what, what do I think? And that's why you have so many cases in court. Uh, freedom of association, freedom of, of registering a trans organization, freedom of uh, registering a, a LGBT organizations. So it's, it's about, and this case is continue, continuously keep being won because thank God you have a very, <laughs> good system <laughs> and the judges listen to facts they don't listen to opinion and what you feel so when someone refuses to effect uh, a name change in a certificate academic certificate because they feel like no i don't i, I don't want to do this and i'm the head of that department in that arm of government it's simply bias it's not the law mm -hmm. It's just bias. So in my context, norms and beliefs and this gender, this, this cultural beliefs play a very huge role when they come, and politics, we forget about politics. They play a very huge role in what administrative action you receive as a minority, as a key population. So, so not just changing the law, yeah. but also making sure that those who are in charge of administering the law understand the law and that their personal biases are not dictating how enforcement of the law takes place. Exactly. Perfect. Do you I, mind if I move on to another question? Oh, sure. Do you have another point you wanted to no, just make I, there? No, I, I just wanted to say uh, the, the running uh, uh, theme is as much as you want legal recognition, do you have social recognition? Yeah. And it's the whole burden we have in South Africa where as much as it's okay to be, and they have these very wonderful laws, but you still have the highest in Africa crime rates for LGBTI persons is on to them and, mm -hmm. and they have the best laws. So mm -hmm. the issue is we did not Enforcement feel like- Enforcement and accountability. Ex exactly. exactly, we did not feel- Actual justice. Exactly. So socially, they're not accepted, but legally you are. So you have to balance those two. 
Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Yes, sir. Wow. Yeah. And this resulted in a lot of very ineffective programs because just as was just pointed out about the trans communities, uh, there's very different kinds of attitudes among different ethnic groups. I'll just give one short example. Uh, very short, I, if you don't mind. I'm well, so sorry. You know, <laughs> Anyone? That's a great question. And I would say from my experience, um, I would say pilot testing interventions, doing focus group work, doing community dialogues, doing formative work before the program is really off the ground to inform how it needs to be tailored and adapted for that context. I think that's a big challenge in prevention programming because in the, in the case of uh, young adolescents in particular, much of the evidence of what we know works comes from high income countries, but as I mentioned earlier, 90% of the world's youth live in low middle income country settings where the barriers to health are quite complex. So it's not necessarily the case that we can take something that we know works and translate it into these other settings. And so really getting um, the feedback from the intended users and knowing who, who we want to reach see if they are being reached and get their perspectives on what services they want um, and what their needs are needs to happen um, before the program is off the ground and, and on a continuing basis to kind of see what are the unintended consequences that are happening and, and are we reaching those we intended and providing them with the services needed. But it's a great question. Mm -hmm. So um, just to address the lack of data question. Um, as the transgender community in Kenya, um, we have this whole uh, key populations programming, and thank God for our government very uh, integrating, very uh, willing to work with key populations. But for a long time, trans populations have not been mentioned in Kenya's programming under key population. And this is simply because of st structural issues. They feel like they those HIV programming is not directly, uh, inf does not ad directly address their issues. They feel like HIV is not a burden for them. They want to focus on the issues like change name, transitioning, and all these things. So as, as, um, as a point to move forward, and with this research, basically what it did is it kind of opened our eyes into that. We went, the fact that that is that little lack of recognition within the government atmosphere, it meant we were not recognized and we were not mentioned in any programming out there, even in the world. So some, there's a program that says, or, or data, sorry, that says we don't have any information about the trans population in Kenya. So what this made us do is include and work directly with the Ministry of Health in Kenya to kind of just have them in our sessions, have them in our trainings. We conduct very various medical trainings in Kenya, and we want to 
address our issues uh, to these practitioners because it's very much health related. So this actually meant that we were we would be we would publish a report after that meeting, and publishing that report will mean uh, the Ministry of Health will under under the key population department will pick that up and say there was this strain that happened and this and this happened. So in addressing that, there was that issue of we have initiated some sort of addressing of issues in, in terms of now we have started um, and have, have acknowledged that HIV is a problem and we can address it in various ways. We can connect gender affirming services to HIV related issues and connect them together. So that kind of this research kind of opened our eyes into that and the issue the importance of integrating the two. Yeah. Opened our eyes. Last word, Pamela. <laughs> yeah, just to add uh, some ideas. In Latin America there is a few um, data that is um, uh, analyzed by ethnic um, by ethnic uh, in, in gender matters, and they say they show that um, native cultures have more risk uh, have, yeah have more risk to to get pregnant at an early age. Uh, and that's, I think, I, I can't speak for all Latin America, but in, generally in Chile, uh, that's because um, their culture is like that. So they have something bigger than loss uh, that says them that is correct to to rape a girl or or that. Uh, 11 year, g years old uh, girls uh, could have a, a child. So, yeah, I think, and I agree with you, Gadi, that um, it's not just the, the thing that we have to translate policies to ethnic uh, cultures or native cultures, we have to adapt them to their culture. So, it's not that we, we in Chile is is like every day uh, that we put the, the same policies in different spaces and it's like the same thing but with different names so it doesn't adapt to the context. Uh, you can't um, refer, uh, you, you can't treat the same uh, Amapute that is our native um, a culture or a Rapa Nui that they are really, 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 really <laughs> patriarchal um, culture as they, as we treat uh, a, a, Chile, a Chilean, like a, a Santiago, a, a, a boy of Santiago than a boy from a rural, rural uh, space. So, yeah, we have to try to adapt policies more than try to copy, like exact the same because it worked once. So yeah. The importance of different rural, urban, as yeah. well as ethnic, yeah. as well as gender identity um, differences in our data, our policies, and our services. Hopefully, moving forward. With my apologies, I'm getting the signal that we've come to the end of time. Lexi has a request for the audience, which is that if you would like to come forward and take a selfie yeah. with those of us who are up here, we can do that. And then you can ask any lingering questions on your way out of the room, which we do unfortunately have to vacate. So anyone who wants to be part of the selfie experience, please come forward now. <laughs>